Welcome to Web3 with A6 and Z, a show about building the next generation of the internet from the team at A6 and Z Crypto. That includes me, your host, Sonal Choksi, former showrunner and longtime host of the A6 and Z Podcast Network, and now editor in chief at A6 and Z Crypto. This new show is for understanding and going deeper on all things crypto and Web3, including by offering occasional data readouts and insights directly from the leading scientists and makers in the space. But in these initial episodes, we'll start by setting some quick context before we dive deep the rest of the season on topics ranging from auction design and mechanics, NFTs, security, zero knowledge, gaming, decentralized media, tokenomics, history, infrastructure, roadmaps, and much, much, much more. In the form of everything from interviews to oral essays, and we'll always, as is a signature, respect your time and attention. So stay tuned. For today's episode, and to kick things off, we did an A6NZ crypto hallway style conversation on the markets, mental models for thinking about crypto, and briefly touching on methods and metrics, as well as sharing key trends that are top of mind. Our guests include Chris Dixon, founding general and managing partner at A6NZ Crypto, and Eddie Lazarin, head of engineering at A6NZ Crypto. Both were also co-authors, along with Darren Matsuoka, who led the data, and Robert Hackett, who led the editing, on our recently released State of Crypto report, which we refer to in this episode, and that you can find at a6nzcrypto.com slash state of crypto. For those that are interested, we also cover some FAQs and methodology that we didn't share in that report at the end of this episode after the credits, along with some behind the scenes. Finally, just a reminder that none of the following should be taken as business, legal, tax, or investment advice, nor be used to evaluate any security. Furthermore, companies mentioned are not representative of all A6 and Z investments, nor are there any guarantees of their performance or future results. Please see a6nz.com slash disclosures for more important information, including a link to our investments. And with that, let's go. All right. So let's talk about where we are. So it's May 2022. Crypto has been around for something the order of 13 years. We just got through what seems like a big bull market, a lot of investment, a ton of new companies formed. It seems like assets throughout the world have declined, particularly risk on assets, as they say. So high flying tech stocks, things like that. Although the overall you know, market seem a little spooked. People are worried about inflation. We might be entering a recession. So that's kind of the broad backdrop. And anyway, what I've been thinking about a lot lately is now as we enter this new, what appears to be a new financial environment, what's going on in reality in the layer that really matters, which is the kind of technology product layer. So in the 10 years I've been in crypto, there've been two, this might be the third major downturn. We'll see the third winter. The first one, 2014, 15, 16. The second one, 2018, 19-ish. A few years ago, we asked the question, these cycles seem kind of random to outsiders, but as insiders who live and breathe this, we felt like there was kind of a pattern. And specifically, the theory was that what would happen is the price would go up that would generate more interest, more press, more social media activity, leading to more entrepreneurs, developers, creators entering the space, new products being created, planting seeds that would then develop over the next few years. At some point, people got a little bit overexcited about some of these genuine kind of tech breakthroughs, but maybe they were the speed at which they would mature was overestimated. The markets dropped again. But very importantly, you had the seeds planted, new software, new products, new infrastructure, new companies formed, which then kind of created the next wave. And I think we saw that you did all the data analysis. An interesting thing that came out of it, we did see, and we published this in the blog post and we published it again recently, I see the crypto report. We believe that we saw like a real causal pattern there during the last winter. It was a bit over two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Two years ago. And the analysis was like, basically, if we're right, all of these sort of seeds planted in 2018, specifically a lot of sort of infrastructure, Solana, Avalanche, near this big wave of L1s, L2s, Optimus, et cetera, a bunch of applications, DeFi, Uniswap, Compound, et cetera, NFTs, OpenSea, Dapper, those would eventually mature, get people excited. It's kind of what happened, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting is that when you're seeing everything in the flow, it's pretty clear to me how many new seeds have been planted over the last couple of years. And it makes a lot of sense why it should take some time for those seeds to germinate, so to speak. Take, for example, the scaling solutions that we're seeing just starting to grow now, right? Like Optimism, Arbitrum, ZK Sync, like they're at their earliest stages. 
but you can see publicly on chain, they're just starting now to take up about 1% of the on-chain block space in Ethereum. Right? They're just starting to be real. And these ideas like optimistic rollups and zero knowledge rollups and so on, we started hearing about them years ago. Yeah. Eddie, quickly explain optimistic rollups and zero knowledge or ZK rollups. So optimistic rollups and ZK rollups both scale their underlying blockchains like Ethereum. An optimistic rollup, the basic idea is that you can aggregate all the transactions together into a single checkpoint and put that onto the underlying layer one blockchain and create a period where anybody can permissionlessly come along and check that the work was done properly. If the work was done properly, there's no problem. After some period, those changes are accepted. But if there is a problem, someone can construct a proof, and it's called a fraud proof. It's like a cryptographic object that shows definitively that something was calculated incorrectly. And if they post that fraud proof onto layer one, they actually get a reward for doing so. So the way that the game theoretics met out is that if there's a problem, someone out there is incentivized to find it because it's free money. And if there's no problem, well, as long as the sufficient amount of time passes, we can all kind of trust that, yeah, there probably wasn't a problem because someone would have wanted to get that free money. Right. And see, optimistic. <laughs> I love it. Exactly. By the way, this is a terrible analogy. This makes me think of like one of those plain questions people would ask each other. Like, do you give trust by default or do you wait for people to earn your trust? Optimistic rollups remind me of the former model where you give the trust up front until proven wrong. It's like how humans engage is this model, essentially. That's exactly right. I love the Navy in crypto. Me too. And I also like it because I think people forget when we talk about systems of code that they're very human systems. Like at the end of the day, code is just a way for people to create and transact and share with each other. Oh, exactly. Exactly right. And that's literally the purpose of all of this. Okay, ZK rollups. So zero knowledge proofs are about proving that a fact is true without having to reveal the fact. In this case, you're revealing that the computation occurred in a valid way without actually revealing all the computations. So a ZK rollup also aggregates a bunch of transactions into one checkpoint or one piece of data. The difference is that it comes along with it a special kind of cryptographic instrument, a specific cryptographic proof, some call a validity proof, which is a proof that actually all the calculations that are alleged to be in this piece of data were done correctly. And that's a very kind of counterintuitive idea. Like if someone says they added two big numbers, how do you know that they're right without having to do the addition yourself? Of course, you could check their work by doing the work for yourself, but it's much slower to do that, especially if there's a lot of complex calculations in doing this. It could take you a very long time to replay someone's work, especially if, for example, it's many thousands of transactions that occurred all over the blockchain from all over the world. So instead of having to calculate it all yourself, if there was a way to construct a proof that it was done correctly, so a very short, quick and dirty way to verify that everything was done, and you could probably accept right away what was alleged. And that's how zero-knowledge proofs are used to scale an underlying blockchain. It just takes this long for them to start to work, and it will probably take some time for them to become the predominant computing layer for Ethereum. Like, and that's kind of been the design all along. Just like, for example, the migration to proof of stake for Ethereum, that's not just some recent trendy idea. It's been in the works for years, probably five or more years at this point. It just takes that long for the incremental technology and like research innovations to take place. And it takes a long time because it's complex. And also because these are decentralized systems and you need a lot of people to come together and agree on them. Exactly right. So from my view, when I look at how everything's going, it feels like despite financial turbulence, things are proceeding according to plan. In the loosest sense, of course, there's no specific plan. These are decentralized systems with tons of different participants, with tons of different motivations and interests and incentives. And it's chaotic. Definitely when you're deep in it, it's chaotic. But when you kind of zoom out, you can see that each incremental piece of tech that we've needed to make this kind of thing work or make that type of thing work, or even to be able to experiment with this new type of application, like they're all coming in like one at a time. And it feels like sometimes the excitement can outpace the level of tech development. But I actually think there's a reason for this too. The fact that people can buy these things and can own a part of them and that they can trade freely, it contributes to the ability to talk about it. The prices can change. Like all these effects are things that weren't even possible 
in previous generations of the web, because the only way that people could get access to these things before Web3 is either by working at the company, being a privileged investor, or starting your own company. And the fact that anybody can buy these assets now means you get a little bit of the chaos one expects from democratization, yeah. from just broadening access to wider groups of people. That creates turbulence. It's also part of what makes Web3 is that everybody can get skin in the game. Everybody can be an owner. Everybody can participate. Crypto has always been retail-led and institutional followed. Like the institutions are always way behind. My mental model is retail is very good at macro and bad at micro. And institutional is very good at micro and bad at macro. Mm, that's interesting. Say more. Part of the point of this episode is mental models. So I want to hear more about that and how it fits here. So retail gets the big ideas. So retail gets that like crypto is a big thing. Retail meaning like your smart software developer in Ohio who like lives and breathes code all day gets why a blockchain is a big deal, right? In a way that a banker in New York doesn't. And so they get the macro. They get self-driving cars. They get AI. They get the macro. Micro is very hard because they don't have the diligence teams. They don't have the access. They can't go and say, okay, here are 10 layer one blockchain. I did deep work. And I can tell you which ones are better from a distributed systems point of view. How could they? They're like behind the keyboard playing a game. I think it's much more advanced on the kind of zeitgeist side and just understanding where the future is going than the banker in New York, but doesn't have the tools, right? The banker in New York essentially grasps lines through charts, don't really have vision, don't really understand technology. Almost none of them have knowledge of computer science or the internet, but they have teams of people and they're able to say this LIDAR company is better than that LIDAR company, this AI company is better than that. And so... I think one thing with crypto is because it's been retail-led, they, I think, are directionally correct. Get the macro, get the big picture, get excited by new concepts, but they also can't distinguish. And frankly, the regulators have decided instead of going after the bad projects, they're going to go after the good projects. And as a result, you get people who are directionally correct, they're excited, but some of the projects they choose are bad. Some of those things blow up. And then you get this kind of chaotic up and down cycle that we see. But one that I think is directionally long-term correct, but chaotic in the short term. An analogy I've used uh, is sort of flying a plane with instruments versus through sight. I've never actually flown a plane, so this is very much a, <laughs> a metaphor. But you fly when it's foggy or something else, you know, using your instruments. And when you use your instruments, you have to kind of trust the system, right? And you can't kind of rely on your senses. And in my experience, if you just sort of trust your senses, and by senses, I mean the news you read, the people you talk to, your kind of instincts, it's very easy to get caught in this up and down herd mentality cycle of markets. This is not, by the way, a new idea that only I've had. It's a common idea. If you read people like Howard Marks and others who talk about market cycles and sentiment, and what happens in these kinds of cycles is in a good cycle, in a positive cycle, Every piece of news gets interpreted positively. Everything is kind of self-reinforcing. It's a sort of availability cascade where, you know, more and more good news leads to more and more good news. And in a negative cycle, it's the opposite. And so a very important thing to do, I think, when you think about innovation, entrepreneurship, the future, seeing where the world is going, is developing frameworks to parse information in the world, look at patterns, look at the evolution of products. I always talk about sort of in computing cycles, a very important kind of reinforcing feedback loop between infrastructure and applications. So, you know, the first iPhone came out in 2007, the App Store in 2008, kind of the golden period of app development and Snap, Instagram, Venmo, Uber were all created with 2009 to 11. That created a whole bunch of new use cases for phones, which in turn gave Apple and Android, Samsung, et cetera. You know, they sold more phones. They had more money to invest. They built better phones better phones led to more apps. You had this reinforcing cycle. Understanding things like where are we in that flywheel cycle of the computing cycle is very, very important. And so that's the instruments. And what you see around you is this shit show of people freaking out and panicking or on the flip side, everything's wonderful and we're all geniuses. You know, keep focused on the fundamentals, on the technology, on the products, on the entrepreneurs and the, where's the talent going. That's the kind of instruments in my mind. And that's for me, has been a kind of mental model that has served me very well, mm -hmm. is developing those frameworks and then sticking to them and ignoring the stuff you see around you. I love that mental model. This is not like a normal technology cycle because it's not just a matter of new technology leads to new types of things that people can build and it takes some time for them to find that new tech and build on it and incorporate it and learn it and add to it. And then that creates new things, that kind of serial process. 
the fact that you can put price into it because these are assets that you can own and that you can give to people and that you can receive through doing interesting things. When something is permissionless and open and exciting, you can get hordes of people who are super interested in the thing barging down the door. And that's a powerful, super interesting effect. You also allow unusual and new types of talents to be attracted to it. You know, like Chris was saying, the engineer in Ohio who just thinks about code all day maybe was never going to work for a big investment bank or for a major Silicon Valley company, but is a brilliant engineer nonetheless. They may be attracted to this and contribute and benefit and have an impact that they never could have just because of how open and permissionless it is. So those two super powerful forces are at play in a new way, and that creates chaos in the short run. In the long run, I think it creates more innovation at a faster pace. You know, I was going to add one thing to that, which is I think it creates more composability and opportunities for composability. Because when you think about how communities form around lore and like storytelling, able to exchange ideas around the frenzy and excitement of an idea, like the memes, frankly. Yeah. I was even thinking of an example like loot and the activity that is entirely enabled by having a community and that kind of excitement. So it's not just an either or, it's something in between too. Yeah, exactly. This is like an incredibly fine edge. Yeah. You know, like this is a incredibly powerful instrument. This ability to create growth by like making assets that people can speculate on and that you can give as rewards. That is an incredibly powerful tool that we don't even know how to use yet. I firmly believe that the next wave is going to be people thinking much more carefully about designing sustainable types of growth and using the incredible growth tool. Yeah. But thinking very deeply about retention and keeping people in the system. And yeah, I think of token rewards as like mentally, I picture it like you blow up a balloon and you let it go and it flies around the room and it zigzags and hits yeah. the yeah. wall and Butters. bounces around. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not a rocket scientist either, nor am I a pilot, but I imagine <laughs> people that originally built rockets and planes had the same problem, right? And then eventually, I don't know if they bounced around the room, but I'm sure they didn't go in the direction they wanted it to. And the whole thing was like, how do you take this incredibly powerful new force and kind of control it and make it go in the direction you want? And I think we're in that phase of crypto right now. Yeah. Yeah. Like it is a nuclear level force, the power of taking people who have been disenfranchised, who sat on the sidelines, who basically effectively, you know, 98% of the people on the internet are left out of the internet economy. Everyone who uses Facebook is not really part of that economy. But the question now, to me, the most important question that we'll be discussing in the next couple of years is how do you take that new kind of rocket fuel that's right now, in some cases, flying out of control and doing crazy things and leading esteemed publications to constantly say that crypto is a bunch of Ponzi schemes and everything else. And how do we take that powerful force and harness it to fulfill the Web3 vision? And to me, the Web3 vision is how do we build new networks? The killer app of the internet is networks. This is what you do with the internet. The internet is a system upon which you build new networks. You can build a network like Facebook or Twitter or email, SMTP, the web. And I believe there's going to be 10,000 new networks created in the next hundred years. How do we use tokens to create new networks where the people that do the work of building a network own and control the network instead of the company and the people that fund it and the founders of that company in a way that builds better networks that are more inclusive and that incentivize long-term positive behavior and that help a bunch of networks that previously was just very hard thing when you're building out a network in the beginning, the cold start problem, the chicken egg problem, the initial hump. And one of the very powerful things with tokens is we can now use those to incentivize users to help those networks get to critical mass. Yeah, I mean, a question I'd ask someone who is skeptical of this is like, how do you design a network so that enforcing and encouraging pro-social behavior yep. is native to the network? There is no way to do that in a network that is just owned by someone. I'll take the other side. I mean, just defend it. Like the Joel Spolsky at Stack Overflow would be the closest to the other side. You use games, you know, badges, maybe Wikipedia. So there have been a few cases where it's worked, I think. In the kingdom of a benevolent dictator. Like, it's just fake. Let's just admit it. Like the Web 2 narrative, of uh, people feel like they're part of these companies and it's a community. It's a fake narrative. They use these words like community and it's all bullshit. Like no one actually feels outside of the venture capitalists like us and the owners and a few other people feel like they're owners of those companies, right? 
has anyone ever shown up to a convention and said, you use Facebook, I use Facebook. Oh my God, we're both Facebook users. That's awesome. I feel a sense of kinship to you the way that they just showed up to Gary Vee. Gary Vee had a convention in Minnesota, 10,000 people show up at a football stadium to talk about Vee Francis NFT project. To my knowledge, I think the first time in the history of the internet that's ever happened, that consumers, not developers, not FA, not Salesforce, Streamforce, consumers have flown across the country 10,000 of them to talk about a consumer internet product. They did it because they have skin in the game. Because it's like, it's a new thing that people finally feel. These people, they felt left out and now they feel like they're part of it. And it's a very powerful force. The other thing I think is that how many scaled networks do you have in the internet now? Like 20, 30? There aren't that many. Yeah. And there's like a million things you can imagine doing on the internet, including like just as an example, dealing with a crypto protocol that is trying to build kind of a grassroots telecom and alternative to Verizon and AT&T and wouldn't it be cool if you could build an incentive system so that people would put up the transmission hardware on their house and other places. They've done half of it. They've built the supply side. Like it covers the states now. And that's a network that very likely could not exist without tokens. And there are many others that are probably out there that haven't been created yet. Actually, going back to this idea of networks, it's not just networks as in networking and networking with each other. And going back to Eddie's point about what makes something inherently pro-social and creates kind of these multilateral, just like really like, not like hub and spoke interactions where you have like a central player. It's all mediated through a platform like Facebook groups. People can certainly interact with each other in those groups, but it is still in, as Eddie said, the kingdom of the benevolent dictator. Yeah. And on top of it, they don't control the moderation policies. They don't get to set that. Like maybe at whatever levels that Facebook decides and predetermines, they get to pick down from some pre-designed configuration. They may be able to tier it slightly, the permissions and settings for their group, but that's about the max. Yeah. They can't decide, like a group can't decide on Facebook, hey, we want to reinvent the breastfeeding groups or whatever groups there are. They can't reinvent that from scratch. And so I just want to put in context what you mean about the ability to do that. And that goes to your point about community, because like this weekend you treated this line, which I thought was really profound, that a community isn't just when people have an affinity for the leaders, that's celebrity. It's when they also have an affinity for their peers. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying about like the Facebook line. Like you don't go to a bar and like, oh my God, you use Facebook, I use Facebook. Or you would go to a bar and say, oh my God, you have a board ape, I have a board ape. Oh my God, you're a B friend, I'm a B friend. And that's, I think, directly correlated to feeling a sense of ownership in the community. And NFT is an example. It's the first time that people on the internet have felt that way. And that's why no one in 30 years of the internet who shows up to conventions for Facebook, Google, some of the YouTubers do because they're making money. Again, skin in the game, right? If you have skin in the game, if you make some money, if you feel like you're part of it, you'll show up. So far, the consumers have been left out of the party on the internet. They're just the product, right? They're the ones getting surveilled, getting shown ads. Now they're getting to this bit. This is the whole promise of Web3. I mean, I think the only other communities that feel this that weren't mentioned as like game communities, like video games. Yeah. But that's also clearly because gamers, for really interesting reasons, they feel a sense of ownership of games, even though they don't, right? They don't have any ownership, but they feel a sense of ownership. Is it status? It's status ownership, right? It has something to do with status, something to do with just being devoted to the thing and like spending all this time, like incredible amounts of time and having in-game assets. Isn't it kind of sad that then they end, it's like this fake love affair and then the game winds it down or gets unpopular and they're like, one day I used to be really great at some game. Well, what they do is they go fight with the game publisher for years to get some kind of carve out so they can maybe spin up their community server that's like underfunded. Or they go off market into like secondary markets to make trade and do more and build community. Like everything's happening outside of the game because there's such a need for that. Exactly. They do either one of those things. My friend Eugene Wei, he wrote that famous post about status as a service. He has this whole interesting theory about what happens when there's a loss of status and that we don't talk about it enough. And I think that really applies to the Web 2 versus Web 3 analogy. Like we haven't actually spent a lot of time thinking about that as well in these networks. That's very interesting. By the way, just one more line that Dixon had this weekend. There was a guy who responded to his quote about what's a community which I thought perfectly described what you guys are talking about. Yeah, He said the difference between a community and an audience is which way the chairs are facing. And to Eddie's point, the pro-social version is the chairs face each other. But in the Web 2 version, the chairs are facing one way, like it's only bilateral. You face towards or against. It's audience, fan versus creator. Or like, look at the tweets about VCon this weekend. There were a few tweets that showed people looking up at the stage, but the vast majority were a bunch of people that had never met who were internet friends all meeting together and like, it's the same idea, right? It's peer-to-peer, not peer-to-leader. Exactly. One question I want to ask you kind of to segue here, like when I think about crypto, I think of a lot of analogs to open source. 
and OG open source communities, which I spent like almost two decades studying and writing about and editing. And I have a question for you guys, which is what's different now, A, and B, what can we and can't we borrow from like open source to now? So good question. First, let's talk about the history of open source. So open source started in the 80s with Richard Stallman at MIT, who was motivated by extreme anti-copyright sentiment. And he created these famous sets of Unix tools, GNU, GCC, I think a whole bunch of other things. And then kind of in the 90s was, I think, mostly dismissed as a kind of left-wing political movement. And then in the 2000s and 2010s, morphed into a very major technology movement. I think today, my guess would be 99% of the software on earth is open source. Almost every server you run, your Android phone is Linux. A lot of your iPhone is open source. So it's a very interesting story, which I don't think has been properly told. First of all, I think that the main reason of one, it's a couple of things. One, it morphed from the political movement into the technology movement. And two, fit strategically in with a lot of big corporate interests. So the biggest funder of Linux is Intel. Intel funds Linux as a counterweight to Windows and other proprietary operating systems that run on top of it. It's a complicated kind of strategy question as to why. So that really works. But I think the most important thing is what we call composability. So composability is the idea that you can take a piece of software on GitHub or some other place and fork it, copy it, and build another piece of software on top of it and assemble the software together the way you would Lego bricks. And this allows you, the community, the world, to develop software in a much faster way. Yeah. How is Web3, how is open source in crypto different from open source before crypto? One immediate path that's clear to me is that in a crypto project, when you're working on a crypto project in open source, and this isn't true of all crypto projects, but it's true of many crypto projects, that they can eventually become a decentralized protocol that people can have access to those tokens. Whereas an open source project by default, pre-Web3, is not actually an investable project. It may become a super popular library that people love that spreads all over the internet and becomes like a critical piece of the developer's toolkit, but that's a different kind of result than something's becoming economically very meaningful, that it creates a lot of value that a lot of people can use. It's just a fundamentally different thing. Like if you look at, for example, React, so like Facebook's open source front end framework, or look at like requests like the open source library for Python for making HTTP requests. Like those are huge libraries. It would have been very interesting to track their activity. But as far as I can tell, React has only monetized indirectly, you know, as a result of, I'm not even sure exactly like how Facebook benefits from it. And then request hasn't at all, just subsists on a very meager diet of donations. Whereas open source crypto projects, they can potentially become something that's self-funding or community owned so on and so forth. It's just a totally different sort of evolutionary pathway. They can become much more sophisticated, much more advanced, starting from the same early form. Just a little bit of code will contribute to. I like to say that composability as a software as compounding interest is to finance. In the same way in finance, you put a dollar in and it grows and it grows and it grows in this kind of seemingly magical way because every year the interest compounds upon the interest. In the same way with composability, the software compounds upon the software. And I think it's the core driver of open source. So in crypto, of course, almost everything in crypto is open source. It's an ethos. It's aligned with the movement. There's weird cultural tensions that a lot of current prominent open source people actually are anti-crypto. I think a lot of it's some sort of weird mix of generational differences and political differences. I think crypto is perceived to be slightly right-wing because of the history of Bitcoin. It's not. That's a non-true narrative, but a narrative nonetheless. I think some of it's generational. Crypto is a new thing. It's threatening. It's different. They just miss it for a bunch of reasons. They're culturally very different. They're ideologically very aligned in that they believe in open access, permissionlessness, democratization of knowledge and ideas. I think over time, they will come back together as generations evolve, change, retire, as the technology kind of rises above the politics. You know, in the early 2000s, you're in technology, you'd read about Microsoft. I read everything about Microsoft in the 90s. The word Linux, to my knowledge, like in the antitrust trial, all the other things never came up. Linux was ultimately the thing that dislodged Windows. And that's 99% of the servers in the world are Linux, not the Windows server. It's now like, I think, a fairly niche server. At the time, it was like Java and all these other kind of corporate competitors. It's really remarkable how it went from 
niche political movement to irrelevant, to a toy, to by far the most dominant software in the world. It's very underappreciated, even by a lot of technology advocates, like exactly what was that driver that made it go from this niche political movement to 99% of the software in the world. I think it's an undertold and underappreciated story. I would argue you can't begin to understand software and technology if you don't have a good explanation for how that happened. I was just going to add that code, like content, all these things, it wants to be free. It wants to be distributed across the widest set of people, people to use it, people to understand it, people to build on it. That's the natural end state of complex and interesting systems. Web3 makes it possible for people to do that, but then to still maintain some ownership of the underlying thing. One of the things that makes me so excited about Web3 as a movement is that it has been too profitable and too useful as a business tool to make opaque the most important types of code. And because of the new kinds of business models and the new types of ownership and ways of thinking in Web3, that it just seems much less likely that the companies of the future will want to hide their code. I agree. I'd add a third thing, because based on my studies of evolution of open source, I feel like I could write this book someday. But I would add DAOs to this as well, like decentralized autonomous organizations as mechanisms for organizing the communities and activities. And that's very native to crypto. And the reason is when you look at the history and culture of open source and how it's evolved, a lot of it boils down to how the communities were organized as very big kind of monolithic entities. And then they would fork and have like different ways of splitting the communities. They'd be very religious wars, all very interesting to follow. But the other big movement that kind of came around in the last decade and a half was obviously like this move towards microservices, more modularization. And DAOs are another way of organizing like smaller groups to transact and create culture, essentially, and transact and change governance models around code and how to use that code and what to do with that code. And so I would actually add that as a third kind of cultural thing to this as well that's going to change the way open source comes into the age of crypto. Totally agreed. I think we're still in the earliest days just because forget the tech, forget the tokens and the blockchains and multi-sigs and DAO votes and staking and all this type of stuff. Like just on a pure cultural level, it's a new thing for groups to be able to very quickly and easily align their incentives around like a specific specialized goal and manage like a pool of capital that's like global and transparent. Like all these types of things on a personal human level are sort of new. Yep. And we haven't quite developed the cultural technology around like what it means to be a stakeholder and how to get people aligned and how to measure people's participation. These are all sort of totally non-tech things, but they're important prerequisites, I think, of being able to advance yeah. the tech. That's one of those things that might just take generational time to resolve, but I think it's inevitable that it will be resolved. Yeah. I agree 100%. For me, one of the questions that does come up is when I look at our data, we do a lot of talking about developer activity, but yet it's not only enough. Is open source has had plenty of users. Is developer activity enough of a proxy to say like this is going to be a real thing? Because, you know, open source has a lot of activity. Yeah, it's a really challenging one, actually, because you need to classify all the repos on GitHub that are crypto related, right? Not every crypto related repo is just going to say it's crypto repo. Mm -hmm. So we use... Electric Capital's crypto ecosystems repo on GitHub as a mapping. We've contributed a little bit to it and extended it, made some modifications, but we're building a bunch of internal tooling to be able to quantify live developer activity across all these different crypto ecosystems. And that'll mean that we can be way more granular about showing how many monthly active developers are there in different portions of crypto. The second question I would ask you, and you did a lot of work with Darren on this too, but like, in this recent update, which is essentially an update to the 2020 post, the state of crypto, what changed methodologically to account for the new era of this current fourth cycle of crypto? Well, one example of a change that was really big, but worked out and we spent a lot of time wringing our hands about was in the original blog post, the social media activity section was actually Reddit comments. And the way that that worked was I collected every subreddit that was just clearly a crypto subreddit. And there's some that are kind of on the fence. I didn't count those, just the ones that are just obviously about crypto. Yep. And then just counted all their comments and just said like, this is just a measure of kind of engagement. A super high level, not trying to be cute about parsing each comment, just let's count the number of comments. And that was really clean. The hardest part was just collecting all the subreddits, which it's actually not that hard. Like if you can query all of Reddit data, it was only several hundred subreddits at the time. 
in this case, we actually moved away from Reddit. And mm. now the social media activity is all Twitter, all tweets. Not Discord. Not Discord. And the reason Discord would have been good, the problem is that Discord's API is difficult, not just for pulling messages, but also for finding all the relevant Discord servers and then joining them. Discord is less public, right? It's harder yeah. to find Discords. Not all are public. Yeah, it's more like a dark forest. I you use the analogy of like the Fermi paradox and Reddit is more like a public directory. Exactly. And so is Twitter. It's like they're very public. You just go there and see basically everything by default. We looked into using Discord data, but it's just really, really gnarly to get that. The Twitter data is way easier. You just need to query the API. The hard part in that case is you have to pick the terms that you're going to use. And of course, you might be tempted to use terms like token. These days, a lot of the uses of the word token have to do with crypto, but it's far from 98%. It's far from precise enough to be really, really tight about the data. So we curated a list, a non-exhaustive list by design of keywords that are just almost certainly crypto related, like Ethereum, ZK rollup, optimistic rollup, all these different terms. And the idea here was not to try to capture every single tweet that was crypto related, that's impossible, but instead to really tightly quantify some lower bound of tweets that are definitely about crypto. The hope there is that you'll actually more carefully capture the waves the ebbs and flows of interest. Super interesting. Yeah, because otherwise you're just getting a lot of background noise and like the ebbs and flows may be a function of Twitter generally. So we went back and we segmented different years to find as many keywords as we possibly could from each era. It's actually a really funny thing going back to like the 2017, 2018 era and seeing sort of the lack of certain terms. Even when CryptoKitties is a thing, nobody's really talking about NFTs in 2017. One thing that's funny to me is like terms like dApps when they first came out, app coins and dApps were a thing, decentralized apps. Now people do yeah. use dApps, but I think intuitively, tell me if this turned out true, far less than they did before. Oh, yeah. yeah. Way less. Also, Ico, right? Ico was like an obsession. Oh, right. Like initial coin offering. Right. Like, my God. Now no one mentions Icos at all, which is great because it was also like... I was about to say it's a regulatory nightmare on that one. It was a <laughs> total regulatory nightmare and a horrible idea. Yeah. Frankly, even in its aid, an adverse signal. So you see these patterns. And of course, as the space has grown, there's been a ton of new language. So, you know, for better or for worse, a lot of the language is, of course, more contemporary language. And that's because there's more new language just because it's bigger, like the wagmies of the world and stuff. We're all going to make it. Speaking of, are we? Let's talk about what do we think is going to happen? Like, let's say there's a downturn. What does that mean? God, I've been thinking a lot about it. Share your unfiltered thoughts. It's so hard to say. Like, on the one hand, I just still viscerally remember what 2018, 2019, early 2020 were like. And just how there was still all this cool stuff. But the space was just so quiet. And the normal conversation I was having with other people was like, oh, isn't crypto that thing that happened and then like ended like a year ago. <laughs> that was like the normal conversation. I can totally see the market cooling off, especially if there's accompanying sort of macroeconomic changes. But I find it just so hard to imagine getting back to a product mindset that's the same as back then. I think it was 2019. I remember sitting with you and maybe Ali or something at the end of the year. And there were like very few products launched at all, if any, that year. It was particularly like this famous quarter and everything was going to launch. It didn't launch. So what happened, right? Ethereum 2015, you had that ICO thing. And then you had people say, hey, Ethereum's cool. Let me riff on it. Let me mod it, essentially, which was the other layer ones, layer twos. So that was 2017, 18. And that all kind of came to fruition around, I'd say, 2020-ish, 2021. Yeah. And today it's still happening. When you and Ali and Eddie were at the end of that last cycle and you were looking at the, like, not anything new had been built. Were you guys actually bummed? Like, what gave you the conviction not to be depressed? Oh, yeah, I was. But also, we knew it was in the pipeline. Like, we invested a bunch of stuff. We were waiting for the launch. Yeah. So if nothing was out there, nothing was being built, that'd be one thing. It was nothing had launched. Like, there's two kinds of delays in software. Delays like it's never going to launch and delays like it's actually delayed. Luckily, it was the case. And we believed it was the case at the time that it was the latter kind but that they had just disappeared away. So, so it turned out to be like, it just, these are hard systems to build. Yeah. And it just took longer. I remember that time. Nothing had launched. It was like Ethereum was the only 
fully programmable yeah. blockchain at the time. And there was all these other ideas for other ones and they just kept getting pushed back. We were actually meeting with a lot of people who wanted to build and kept asking us like, well, what should I be building on? What are the cool things you see launching? It's like, oh man, it's kind of awkward. There's all this cool stuff, but <laughs> it's not out there yet. <laughs> it's like, just wait, please. You know. Whereas now, now there's a hundred things you can point them to. Yeah. This just feels like a totally different time. The only thing that was live at the time was like Maker. This is literally, I think, the first time in human history we have a DAO that's persisted this long with this kind of governance in practice. Like, I don't think there is totally. any other example. This is it. Totally. Oh no, no, absolutely not. No, this is absolutely the leading example. Like the difference now is that we have to have minimally viable infrastructure. You know, it's not perfect, but we have Solana, we have Intel One. Oh yeah, yeah. Like new layered ones, like Avalanche, Solana, Celo, all these new layer one networks, as well as new kinds of applications. Like DYDX was in this category. We have layer twos, we have Avalanche, we have a bunch of other kind of infrastructure, Polygon. We've got a bunch of stuff, which, you know, they all have pros and cons, but they work in a way that they didn't three years ago, number one. Number two, we have a lot more. We have OpenSea, we have Uniswap, we have DeFi, and these things all really work well and have significant users and usage. But then we also have just like a lot of really great entrepreneurs building at the app layer on top with a much faster product cadence. Like they'll be able to release products, some of the games, NFT projects, just sort of social media. Like they have a three to six month product cycle. They don't have to go and figure out these incredibly complex things you have to do when you build a layer one. They can just go build an application. It's much more like building a mobile app. We're kind of getting to that phase where it's sort of like building a mobile app, I guess. And therefore, I have no idea what the prices will do. I think that the products will see a lot of activity in the next 12 to 18 months. And I think there's a scenario where it's actually good a lot of these products have launched in an environment that is not so financialized. Yep, definitely. Where the incentives can be much more around behavior and true economics totally. as opposed to like speculative economics. Yep. So maybe I'm an eternal optimist, but I actually feel like this is all a positive thing and that things were getting kind of silly maybe a month or two ago and some really bad projects. And again, like the regulators only going after the good projects and never the bad projects exacerbate this. And so we had a whole bunch of bad projects and speculation. And now maybe we'll get back to good projects. Yeah, I totally agree. It's so easy to make a token and that token can represent ownership of a thing that is just new. You can do this really interesting thing where you can distribute that token as a reward to the early adopters of the system or the protocol or the DAP or whatever. And that can create growth. And when you compare that kind of growth with Web2 growth, even like paid acquisition growth, where you're just piling money into marketing and throwing users into the top of the funnel, when the market is really, really hot, that Web3 growth case where you can fund user acquisition with the token is set in its most crazy, most overblown, hottest form, which makes it really, really hard to disentangle like real authentic growth. So something I'm excited about is if the market cools off, hopefully that effect is dampened a bit. And also hopefully entrepreneurs and new projects rely less on it and experiment in other more creative, more sustainable ways. It goes back to your point about retention and focusing more on retaining versus only initially engaging. And that actually ties to what Dixon just said about how you can actually innovate more behaviorally because you're focused on what people really want to do versus what they think they want to do just because it's a way to like maybe flip something or make more money, like moving well past the financialization. So I do have to ask you guys both here, how do you think about this idea that community precedes product versus the other way around? And it's kind of along this line of what you're talking about. You have this token as a way to quickly incentivize people, get excited about something, et cetera. But even beyond that, how do you think about the difference between, honestly, a bunch of hot air and something that's kind of real? Like, do you have ways of analyzing it, looking at it, measuring it? Yeah, that's such a great question. So I'll say about community preceding product. Part of the reason for this is creating hype and buy-in, of course. But there's good reasons for this, too. One is that the more attention that a project gets before launch, the more contributors that it earns. And because of the open source ethos, and the sort of partnership and sharing decentralization ethos so common in Web3, you just benefit from more attention and eyeballs. Whenever I look at a new project and I want to kind of sniff out whether or not they have a real community, of course, I go into the discords, I mm -hmm. go into the GitHubs, I like message people, I ask around, I look at who's talking about it in other communities. And you can always tell that something is a high quality project, not because of just the pure hype and the people talking about it, but 
the people thinking about the core ideas and the tech in it and the things that they want to copy from. So that's kind of a qualitative measure. Quantitative measures for better, for worse, are a little bit easier to game. I think, thank goodness, we don't have at least yet a huge problem with like fake GitHub bots starring repos. I've heard reports of it and I've looked into it, but it seems like the problem is not nearly as bad as say fake accounts on Twitter. Maybe I'll leave it at that. Dixon, would you add anything to that? The whole community preceding product? How do you think about it? Well, I think it's also like token and product. I guess the Web2 model was always build a product with no money in it, no monetization, make it popular like Instagram and then get acquired <laughs> or add advertising later like Snap. One thing I learned working closely with Uniswap is if you don't have a token early on, the community kind of rebels. They want to feel ownership. They want to feel like they're part of the project. They want to have skin in the game. And so this old playbook of first building the product and then building the community and the monetization is reversed. And it's a broader pattern in Web3. It's one of the reasons that a lot of entrepreneurs and others don't understand what's going on in Web3 is that I'd like to describe it as an alternative planet where there's different laws of physics. And so things like all of these kind of lessons that we've learned over 10, 20 years on the traditional internet are really flipped in Web3. So for example... What I just described, this idea that you first go build a popular product and then you layer in kind of the community and the skin of the game and the monetization, that's flipped. The idea that in Web 2, interoperability is a pain in the ass. Like, why would you interoperate? And so, like, for a long time and, like, 15 years ago, there were these things called mashups and APIs and other kinds of things, which basically all disappeared. There's almost effectively no consumer APIs anymore on the Internet. Like, there's Stripe and business ones, but not consumer ones. They all went away. And they went away because interoperability turned out to be a pain in the ass. And a thing you don't want to do as a Web2 company, you just want to like build your network, put a wall around them, keep them in there, and then like put ads in front of them, surveil them and put ads in front of them. That was the model. And in the Web3 model, it's no, you do want to interoperate because it's a way to acquire new users and to build your network and to grow your token and to have more people build on top of you and compose on top of you, build software on top of you. So it's a very different way to think about things. You know, you said community, community is many things. It's users, it's developers, it's creative people. Like the way I think about Web3, it's the right way to build networks. We finally figured out after 30 years of the internet and longer of building networks, the right way to build a network and the right way to incentivize network development. And once you do figure that out, it becomes all about how do you grow that network? How do you grow the developers? How do you grow the users? How do you grow the creators? How do you get the ecosystem going, people to build software around it and continue to grow it? So it becomes the only thing defensible, really, ultimately, because all the code and everything else is open source. Community is the only thing defensible in Web3. Yeah, it actually forces everyone to do better by their people, too, because you can compete so easily. Yeah, the switching costs are very low. You're not locked in as a user. Like, I'm locked into Twitter. I have a bunch of followers. I can't leave. I'm locked in. They give you no money, (laughs) but you're locked in. Like, that's kind of Web 2 today. It's like, you're just kind of stuck. There's a famous Scott commenter sent me. It was a clubs with entrapment or something. It's like this whole famous old economist article anyways, but... That, that's what Web 2 is. Yeah, it's like this whole, you join the club, it seems great. It's like this horror movie. Next thing you know, it's like this fucking vampire cult. Like that's Web 2 in my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hotel California. Funny that you say vampire cult too, because I was just thinking of like vampire attacks too. And like, that's kind of a cool thing actually, to be able to like suck out actually users and do things. Just for context, for people who don't know, Scott Commoners is a researcher on a 6 and Z crypto. And he recently published an article that he co-authored in Harvard Business Review talking about how it's actually going to spawn a whole new age of competitive theories and intelligence for how business is done. Yeah, because everything is open source and because so many projects in crypto are composable by default and because there's no shame in kind of copying something that's working and borrowing a business model or retooling some code. I think that something I really, really expect is that over the next year, two years, If something starts to work, I think the speed that it can be incorporated into other projects and then combined and recomposed with other types of existing infrastructure will be so fast that we may end up actually seeing like progressive waves of extremely rapid mini cycles and lots of little growth as the interest areas in crypto expand, right? So for example, if someone figures out something that really, really works in crypto games, the speed that that can connect and have consequences in DAOs connected to that game or in DeFi or in NFTs related to that game or all the other crypto areas, the speed that the ripples can have their effect across these other areas is so fast because of that interconnectedness 
that it just seems so unlikely to me that we end up in a period of general long stagnation. I think that's a really interesting thing in Web3. Mm, that's fantastic. What are the things in the pipeline that you guys are excited about that you guys know of along those lines? I mean, one obvious one is like the merge, you know, things like that, or like other things that are public are going to be public. What would you yeah. say keeps you giving the faith right now? Oh, I, a lot of good stuff. So yes, Ethereum, like the merge and through the stake and just generally kind of upgrades. L2s on Ethereum, I think you'll have kind of no trade-offs L2s within six months on Ethereum. Like 4844 or the IPA, I like this uh, change is going to happen to Ethereum. is going to make them 100x cheaper. Yeah. EIP 4844, also known as Pro Dank Sharding, is a way to create a new type of data in Ethereum that's more short-lived. They actually call it a blob, a blob of short-lived data that can be used by transactions in the blockchain. What that means is that instead of properly storing in the fully robust manner, most data in Ethereum is stored more or less permanently. I'm oversimplifying a little bit. We may introduce some epochs, some so valid lifespans of Ethereum data. But 4844 introduces a special area to store data in a special structure that's very cheap, very short-lived, which means that a whole flurry of transactions can use that cheap and short-lived data store to do complicated things in a way that doesn't require persisting as much data in the long-term storage of the blockchain. It's almost honestly a little bit, I think of like the human mind and like the analogy of like short-term working memory and like your long-term exactly. memories and like letting <laughs> you do more. Like the older you get, the more you forget actually, you know? Oh yeah, no, no, exactly right. Like the more that you store, the more expensive it is, the more onerous the requirements of the machines that validate and preserve this type of data. If you have a bunch that you want to do in a relatively short period and you really don't need to store all the data for it, but you do want to store, of course, the long-term consequences of all those transactions you're doing, mm -hmm. then it sounds like a good idea to store in a temporary area, let a bunch of people use it, and then only persist what needs to be kept. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining that. And so keep going. Dixon, what else would you add kind of lightning round real quick to this? In Solana, there's a whole set of blockchains and the sort of next wave that's going to come out. There's just a whole other wave of kind of things coming on bridges. So bridges moving across blockchains, mm -hmm. layer zero, there's a bunch of other good stuff, better wallets, better developer tooling. That's the infrastructure side, the app side. I would say like a bunch of really interesting stuff happening in the media side of NFTs, people creating kind of like centralized content creation, storytelling, a bunch of really smart people in Hollywood and media have gotten involved a bunch of really interesting gaming kind of related things, social network funded two very high end top end entrepreneurs recently who are well known in kind of creating decentralized social media. So I would say we're really firing on both levels right now, like firing multiple cylinders of both the infrastructure and the application layer. And content. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time. Would you add anything else to that list? Chris covered a lot of the big ones for me, but a couple I'd say... ZK Math is entering like escape velocity where like everybody, everybody I know is talking about zero knowledge proofs and zero knowledge math with regard to privacy and scaling. That's going totally parabolic. Chris alluded to this too, but on-chain games. So this is like the whole family of games where all of the game's logic is on the blockchain. It's way, 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 way out actually seeing this in the wild for mainstream players. But it's a super interesting area where the sort of composability and interoperability components of blockchains get to shine in a game context, which is super fascinating to me. What does it get you, by the way, really quick when you do that? When you go fully on chain with gaming? Well, it means you can decentralize the game. And we've never had a decentralized game. And that sounds like a really awful part and thing to build. Historically speaking, games, of course, are made by like a single team that has total control over the whole experience. But when you decentralize a game, yeah, you lose a lot of control over the development experience, maybe. But you get a game that can also act like a platform, something that people can authentically build on, build very seriously on. And that could be things like mods, and it could be things like new clients and new types of experiences, all on something to do with the underlying game being shared. I could talk about it forever. Got it. No, that's cool. Then like another thing is that there's so many people, well, it's still a very small total number actually, but there's so many more people programming on blockchains now that we're actually getting people who care a lot about programming languages on blockchains, which is really exciting. That's a super interesting subject because until recently, programming languages for blockchains have typically been very loosely adapted contemporary programming languages like 
JavaScript to Solidity or Rust to Solana, right? These are like programming languages that already have some prior purpose and history in Web2 world and are only loosely adapted to blockchain programming purposes. But now we're getting a lot of people talking about custom built programming languages for blockchains. And that includes special kinds of primitives around ownership or around transferring assets and value, things like that. Move is an example that came out of Facebook's DM project and that's being used by a few layer ones that we're working with. There's also new programming languages on Ethereum even. There's like the FE or Iron FE Lang project on Ethereum and a bunch of others. But it's finally something that's getting attention as a first class subject, which is totally overdue and super exciting for me, especially as a programming languages nerd. I think overall, we're in a really exciting time in Web3 crypto blockchains. When I look back at past computer movements, they tend to be these kind of golden periods I talked about before. And I think we're very likely in that period now where there's been a ton of really interesting talent that's come in and people building cool stuff. And so I'm really excited about it. Yeah. Despite the chaos, I'm as excited as I've ever been because of all the really high quality people that we run into. So I'm just so excited to see what everybody builds. Fantastic. Wonderful way to end. Thank you, Eddie. Thanks for joining, Dixon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Fun to talk to you both. All right. Thank you, Sano. Thanks, Eddie. And that's our first episode of Web3 with A6 and Z. There's a little bonus discussion about methods and metrics that follow these ending credits, along with some behind the scenes internal team chit chat. This episode was produced and edited by Sonal Choksi. That's me. The episode was technically edited by our audio editor, Justin Golden, with thanks to longtime sound engineer, Seven Morris. Credit also to Moonshot Design for the art and special acknowledgements to Chris Dixon, founding and managing partner, CMO Kim Milosevic, and several others on our team here for their support. To follow more of our work and get updates, resources from us, and from others, be sure to subscribe to our Web3 weekly newsletter. You can find it on our website at a6nzcrypto.com. You can also find show notes with links to resources, books, or any papers mentioned or discussed, transcripts, and more at a6nzcrypto.com as well. Thank you for listening. Okay, so let's cover some other methodology and metrics, as well as a couple of FAQs that came up with our recent Data Crypto report, which, again, people can find at a6nzcrypto.com slash data crypto. We touched on this already in the episode, but was there anything else that changed for you when you did the original price innovation cycle posts from a few years ago and then the work that the team, including you, did for this recent report? Like, what else changed? Another change from the blog post was that for the prices section, back then we used the Bitcoin price just the Bitcoin market cap. And that was because back even in 2020, I forget the exact number, but Bitcoin market cap was the vast majority of the global crypto market cap. And that is no longer the case. There's tons of other stuff that contributes to the global crypto market cap. So now we just use coin market caps approximation, which is not perfect, but is much more precise than just raw. Bitcoin. Yeah, and it doesn't even matter, frankly, the precision. It's the directionality and the variety that matters. Actually, it's a mix that it's no longer a single dominant thing only. That's the narrative there. Yep, exactly right. Anything more to add? Like, what about addressing some other frequently asked questions that came up? Yeah, yeah, a couple of things. Yeah, no, I, I did actually have a bunch. One is the estimated creator revenues slide. We use averages, which, of course, I know... Like any good data scientist, a median would be much more descriptive here. Not even a good data scientist. Does anybody like, knows anything? Any, 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 anyone on. who knows anything about data. You know, I am like, and just for people who don't know, like the difference between a median and a mean here is really significant because for a lot of creators, there's a lot of big outliers. And when you're using an average versus a median, you're actually counting the outliers when you probably shouldn't be. Go on, say more. Exactly. And that drives me nuts because I would totally <laughs> rather have yeah. a median. Yeah. These kinds of creators, so as you're saying, it's totally power law distributed, which means it's very prone to a mismatch between the median and the mean. That's right. More than anything. It's like the worst case scenario. So I can't even explain how much <laughs> I would rather have not just median data, but I'd rather just have, why not just the full distribution? I'd yeah. rather have a histogram Go for modes. each one of these. Yes, and yeah, bring and, it and all. Like the, the full quantiles for everything and break it all. Like, I'd rather have all that, of course. The problem is that that data is just not available for Spotify, for Facebook, for Instagram, for YouTube. Right. That kind of distribution data that you'd need to really get it to the descriptive statistics is just not available. Yeah. Now, ironically, it's totally available on the blockchain. 
it's actually very easy to calculate the median earnings of an NFT project. That's actually totally straightforward, totally easy to calculate. But we're trying to be as apples to apples as we can. Right. And of course, none of the comparisons are perfect. It's just meant to illustrate on a high level the differences between the ways that people who make content are monetized and participate in monetization across different types of platform. What two, what three? I was just thinking to myself, if you actually use ironically correctly or not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Dixon's whole not ironic thing. I think you did. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I was I actually just thinking yeah. you did because it's dramatic irony if you interpret it that way, because otherwise it would be paradoxically. I was just mentally thinking, you know, Dixon's little not ironic chart. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. Well, it's ironic in the sense that the very feature of a blockchain is the yeah, transparency. It's the transparency, which we can cannot. use. Yeah, exactly. Yes, totally exactly, gotcha. Exactly, exactly, no, exactly. I got you. I was just chuckling to myself. I might not. No, we got to be careful. We got to be careful about misusing <laughs> irony. That drives me crazy, too, actually. <laughs> Well, Dixon is so funny about it. It's so hilarious. Like, he's so funny. He took it off because he's embarrassed by it, but I feel like he should put it back on the internet. It's like a useful chart he had. Yeah. Um, what are the other things totally. you would add? So okay. besides a creator and mean versus median versus the histograms and more? Yeah, another is that on that creator revenue slide, we chose to describe revenue as opposed to profit just because there's all these other factors that play into the profitability of a specific company, whereas revenue directly speaks to the market value of the underlying content selling the attention that corresponds to, right? So for example, in Spotify, a lot of the revenue, Spotify is not actually that profitable. Mm -hmm. And that's because they have to pay upstream licenses for all the content. Extremely yeah. generously for all that content. Yeah. And then like uh, YouTube and Facebook, like Google spends a ton on research still. And that's going to take away from the sort of profitability if you're just talking about pure profit on like an accounting basis. Mm -hmm. Same with Facebook. Like they all spend a ton on other unrelated projects, which are moved from the overall profitability of the system. I think that the revenue is a more precise way to capture the market value of the underlying content. And then you had another thing you said. The other is that when we talk about like the number of creators, mm -hmm. NFTs, it says 22,400 creators. Creators is, of course, a broad word. It really corresponds to NFT projects. But there's a lot of projects that are the work of a single creator. And of course, even on YouTube, like when you talk about a YouTuber, often they have many people working and collaborating with them. Like one YouTuber is not necessarily a solo show. They can be. Many are. Right. But they can be actually like a very produced tons of people behind the scenes, or maybe they don't look that produced, but that's actually part of the bit, you know, and they actually yeah. have a lot of really clever people behind the scenes making that show work. So some people had some reservations around the usage of the word creator. I think that just like artist sounds like a single person, creator sounds like a single person, channel could be a single person. I hope that the nuance is conveyed here that a creator can be a, potentially a group, just like yeah. an artist can be a group or no, a channel totally. can be a group. Totally. I have a lot of thoughts on creator collectives, actually. I love that. Great. Yeah. And one last question on this. One thing you guys actually didn't define it in the deck was TVL, like total value locked. Yeah, this is a super tough one. Part of it is that we don't want to lean into TVL because it's an imperfect metric. And it's also defining it is also a total nightmare because yeah. there's all kinds of ways you could define it that I wish we didn't use TVL, actually. Yep. It's totally imprecise. It's vulnerable to gaming. It describes some types of protocols better than others. Unfortunately, just for path-dependent reasons, it's the key metric that a lot of projects measure themselves by. The right thing is to use vertical-specific metrics. Got it. So like lending, like DeFi lending, mm -hmm. TVL is fine. For a DEX, decentralized exchange total volume is a far more precise metric. For an NFT project, we're kind of in the early days of still defining what the key metrics are, but there's already some really interesting ones like the number of tokens in a collection that are on sale at mm. a given time. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting metric. Another one is the diffusion of the project. So the average number of holders per 10,000 tokens in the collection. Yeah, totally. I would add my own. I don't know if you guys have this on the list, but I care most about the extensibility of that particular oh, yeah. NFT, like how many derivatives have derived from it essentially. Because that is the true art of an NFT being something that is composable and something that you can build around. Oh, totally. Now, back in the early days of Uniswap and Compound, we actually used to, we used to talk about the forkability of a protocol being a leading indicator of its quality. 
if a new protocol drops and a bunch of people are forking it and copying it yeah. and trying to rip it off, like that's not a sign that it's weak and should be abandoned, that it's just easily copied. No, that's a sign that the original is yeah, incredible. Yeah, and it actually you know? undoes a lot of classic VC and business strategy mindsets, frankly, about totally. what moats are. Okay, anything more to add? Because I think we covered all the data methodology stuff. That's it. Thank you so much, Saul.